Tuesday, September 22nd at 8.30 a.m. And uh, before we have our meeting by telephone or by Zoom, we're to read the state statutes that uh, give us the opportunity to conduct our business in the manner that we're proceeding today. <clears throat> I'll read four, five statements. Number one, it has been determined that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent because of the COVID-19 pandemic and a related peacetime emergency declaration made by Governor Waltz, <clears throat> excuse me, in accordance with Minnesota statutes 12. <clears throat> Number two, we have ensured that all members of the body participating in a meeting wherever their physical location can hear one another and can hear all discussion and testimony offered at today's meeting. Number three, we have also ensured that members of the public present at the regular meeting location of the body can hear all discussion and testimony and all votes of the member of the body. We have urged the public not to attend this meeting in person because of the COVID-19 pandemic and have ensured that members of the public can view and monitor the meeting remotely in real time by broadcasting the meeting on the Cook County website. Number four, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have determined that it may be unfeasible for County Auditor Brady Powers, County Attorney Molly Hicken, County Administrator Rena Rogers, and members of the Board of Commissioners to be physically present at the County Boardroom at the Cook County Courthouse. Um, Administrator Rogers is in attendance there in case some people come in. Number five, all votes will be conducted by roll call, so each member's vote on each issue will be identified and recorded. Would you please join me by uh, standing and we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Okay, so um, we'll ask for any other adjustments to the agenda for today's meeting. Is there anything that's going to be added by um, those people that have authority to do so? Okay. Then I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda from a commissioner. This is Commissioner Mills. I move to approve the agenda. Over. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Do we have support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim is aye. Thank you. We'll go to the public comment period. Um, Administrator Rogers, is there anyone there that would like to make public comment or have you received anything by email or in writing by mail that you should share with us this morning? Yeah, th thank you, Commissioner, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I did receive one letter, there is no one present. Okay, so could you read that to us, please? I certainly will. Uh, this letter was written by Jesse Carlson from Grand Marais. Probably better put on my glasses, it's long. Okay. Uh, just for context, my academic and professional background is in sustainable community economic development. This means that I see issues such as racial equity and ecological health in terms of economic structure, community development, and vice versa. Also, as a white person who cares about racial justice, I often find myself feeling like I don't know what I can do that will make much of a difference in the lived experiences of people of color. Often the options presented to me in terms of action appear to be largely symbolic or even performative. I've given this a lot of thought over the, the years. I've also had the privilege of working with and for a couple of tribal agencies, most recently as the environmental education coordinator for Grand Portage, where I was in charge of developing a new program for the band, which would have included creating positions to be filled by native graduate students. From this perspective, I would like to say that I've learned that there are indeed many su substantial decisions that can be made by municipalities and counties 
that would have the potential to significantly impact racial equity, as well as economic development. I'm talking about policy changes that would actually make a difference rather than symbolic statements of solidarity. For example, housing. When I moved here two years ago, I, I was, I was, I was, um, okay, sorry, lost my place. When I moved here two years ago, I was prepared to live in an insulated camper for the winter because I could not find a rental. What I did have was a job offer. I was eager, eager to start a new life in Cook County, but could not find housing. I did what we all know, like myself, have to do. I posted on the Grand Marais Sell and Swap Facebook page and on Boreal.org. Lucky for me, someone saw my post and decided they wanted to rent to me. I was first questioned about my experience living in northern cold places, and luckily, I'm a white Midwestern lady who has done outdoor ed for years, worked for mushers in the past, and fits in as my landlord. So I was able to rent a warm place to live. However, for many folks who have low wage job offers here or are early career professionals and not in a position to qualify for a mortgage, rental housing is the missing ingredient required to relocate here. I've watched several posts on sell and swap turn from excitement over job offer to second guessing the re relocation to deciding to pass on the job and stay wherever they currently have housing. The lack of affordable year round rentals prevents entry level professionals and young enthusiastic low wage earners, the spine of any outdoor or recreational tourism economy from moving here, which also makes it difficult <clears throat> to hire employees. When I worked for Grand Portage, I learned that many Navajo kids who want to stay and cook, uh, I'm sorry, Navajo. Well, it's a throwback to my Arizona days. I learned that many native kids who want to stay in Cook County after graduating from high school end up moving away because they can't rent an apart, a first apartment here. Others who graduate from college would like to return to Cook County but can't find a rental and end up settling elsewhere. This creates a real problem for the Grand Portage RTC. They would like to require college students to receive Tri tribal scholarships to return to Grand Portage to fill positions on the reservation for at least a year or two, but with no housing available, this isn't an option. Another example I was able to create, another example I was able to create positions for native grad students, young people studying outdoor ed and environmental ed to teach in the program I was developing. We had grant money to hire these positions, but because there was no place for them to live year round, we eliminated that portion of the program. If Native youth were able to stay in Cook County after graduation or return to Cook County after college, and if we had housing for Native grad students to fill positions on the res reservation, this would go a long way toward improving racial diversity and equity here, as well as addressing the problem of rural brain drain of our most educated and committed students. And housing doesn't just affect retention of our Native youth. It has a pro profound impact on people of color and young people in general who would like to move to Cook County in order to come here to take a job and to take the time to figure out if Cook County is for them, people on low incomes need rental housing. And if these people are black, and if there are no rentals listed in the classified, no application processes, there is no way for a person of color to prove that they were not chosen for an available rental due to their race. This situation creates an opportunity for landlords to avoid being held accountable to fair housing laws. I know of one such situation playing out right now. A mid-career ex-Peace Corps volunteer, a woman of color, signed up to work as an AmeriCorps volunteer at the Grand Marais Public School this year. She posted and searched for rental housing early this summer. Following all the advice given on, on Facebook thread and in private messages, when her position began this school year, she still had no housing and took a housing job in order to follow through on her commitment to the school. <clears throat> her intention is to see if she likes it here well enough to stay put and eventually retire here. Without year-round rental housing, though, she will be forced to leave in the spring. I hope these examples make it clear what I'm about to say next. If we really care about racial equity in Cook County, we must do more than state our solidarity and our good intention. We need to make impactful economic policy changes. These changes determine who gets to move here and who does not. Changing zone, zoning ordinances so that tiny homes and multi-unit dwellings can be constructed or that would allow existing homes to be split into multiple units or explicitly incentivizing year-round housing rentals to property owners and investors would add to our existing portfolio of housing options and would diversify not just our housing but our community's racial and generational composition. I hope that in addition to taking up a discussion of rate, racial equity in Cook County and in addition to issuing statements of solidarity or land recognition proclamations 
We back up those statements with policy changes that will actually make Cook County a more welcoming place for people of all ages, races, and income levels. This will not only benefit those we begin to include, it will also benefit employers. It will make Cook County a more vibrant place for those of us who already live here. And it will ensure that tourists who come here looking for a safe and inviting getaway will feel welcome regardless of their racial identity. And that was from Jesse Carlson. Okay, thank you to Jesse and to you, uh, Administrator Rogers. We'll go to the consent agenda items for those people you'll maybe notice a little different uh, structure with our consent agenda. We're going to have one area for the regular consent agenda items that we've always done and we've separated that into another one for number four on the agenda and it's going to be a personal personnel consent agenda and I'll explain that a little bit. Let's uh, take a look at the regular consent agenda items. And is there anything that a commissioner would want to pull to further discuss or will approve as a whole? Okay, therefore uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented as a whole. This is Commissioner Mills. I move to approve the consent agenda. Over. Thank you. Commissioner Mills, uh, do we have support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. Roll call vote, Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Bershine, aye, passes unanimously. In the personnel consent agenda items that are presented here today, and in the future, if we continue this, all of these items have been discussed previously at a board meeting to my understanding. So uh, we will take action on them today, but if a commissioner wants to pull any one of these for further discussion this morning, then please do so now. Then I would entertain a motion to approve as a whole. This is Commissioner Mills. I move to approve the personnel consent agenda. Over. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Uh, do we have support? Storley support. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. Roll call vote. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Bershine's aye. We approve those personnel hires or other actions or to post. Number five, Emergency Operations Command update. I see that my keyboard is with us and um, I don't see Grace uh, with yep. us. Oh, okay, thank you, Grace. Okay, who would like to go first to raise your hand? I guess I'll go first. Okay, thank you, Grace. Thanks for all you do. And yeah, thanks for joining us this morning. Absolutely, my pleasure. So since I last gave an update on September 8th, the number of COVID cases in the state of Minnesota rose by 9,717 um, for a total of 90,942. In Cook County, our cases have remained steady at six and this remains the lowest county case count in the state. Um, so updates from our response these past two weeks. Within the Minnesota Department of Health, they have, they have begun to host weekly COVID vaccine planning meetings. There are currently three vaccines in phase three of clinical trials. And so at some point there may be an emergency use authorization by the FDA to introduce one or more of these vaccines into the population in a very measured way. So the Minnesota Department of Health is engaging local public health departments in conversation about planning for this. And Maggie Farshman, who is one of our temporary COVID-19 health educator staff is attending these meetings and she will be reporting out to both myself and Sawtooth Mountain Clinic. Minnesota Department of Health is moving to a new model of case investigation contact tracing using the um, emergency management regions. 
And after discussing this new model extensively with our public health team locally, as well as at the community health board and with our partners in both Grand Portage and Lake County, we are opting instead to form a sort of mini region rather than move to the state's new system. Um, we believe this will allow us to build off of and strengthen the workflows and the partnerships that we've created and refined to date. Um, also with the Minnesota Department of Health, they will have field staff in Cook County this week as part of what they call the CASPER study. It's a public health study to better understand um, people's health behaviors and beliefs surrounding COVID, as well as to look at who has had COVID and how COVID is spread out in the population right now. So they're gonna be visiting a small number of households in Cook County. They'll be asking questions about health beliefs and behaviors. They'll also do free COVID-19 testing. It's both the nasal swab diagnostic test as well as a finger prick, which is the antibody test. Um, people do not have to participate. It's voluntary. There is a $20 gift card for participants who opt to participate. So that's happening this week. And we've been trying to get the word out so that people know that there will be Department of Health staff knocking on doors in a small number of households throughout the county. Um, the school year began since we last met. And there's in-person learning at Birch Grove, Great Expectations, and Oshki Ogamog, and distance learning at ISD 166. Within public health, we continue to hold weekly briefings with leadership from all four schools, as well as with our partners from Grand Portage Health Services, in order to provide situational awareness on the pandemic in our communities and to give school leadership a chance to ask questions of one another and of us in public health. Jody Turbo Roberts, our school liaison, has reviewed safety plans and done walkthroughs at both ISD 166 and GES. She's also been reviewing safety plans and implementation of these plans for various different extracurricular activities as well as sports. Um, and in the line of working with the schools, we've also been within our contact tracing staff, working hard on figuring out a, a workflow and developing tools to respond if there's a positive COVID-19 case in the school setting so that we have everything ready to go if we need to use it. We also published through the EOC a media release thanking our 210 active Minnesota response volunteers for their 4,802 hours of service since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Andrea Orest, who is our EOC volunteer manager, is doing contactless pickup of locally designed shirts as a thank you and a way for our volunteers to identify themselves as they're serving in the community going forward. Our COVID-19 perinatal health educator, Sadie Sigford, will begin hosting virtual peer support groups for families who are pregnant up through two years postpartum starting next week with options for evenings or weekends. We're beginning to publicize these groups uh, this week. Um, in the area of technical assistance, we have begun to see an increase in requests for support with safety planning specifically for events. Um, and we've also created a workflow for responding to complaints related, with compl related to compliance with COVID-19 safety practices. So our, our complaint workflow is really pretty much the same as our business technical assistance support workflow. It's just that it starts with public health contacting a business, letting them know what the complaint was and offering support at looking over their plans. Um, we also were worked with AEOA. Um, we provided volunteers through the EOC to support AEOA and food distribution events last week on September 16th. They were very successful serving 76 households in Grand Portage and 110 households in Grand Marais. And then finally, we're continuing to find new and creative ways to promote our community support line, which is our behavioral health response to the pandemic. And most recently, this looks like a collaboration with Hartley Newell-Lacero, who's the outreach coordinator at Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, 
who will be creating video profiles of some of the volunteers who are staffing the community support line. And that is it for me. Okay, any questions or comments for uh, Grace? Uh, Commissioner Mills, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Grace. Um, I don't have any questions, uh, over. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Dukirk. Thank you, Grace, no questions. Okay, Commissioner Storley. Yes, thank you, Grace. And isn't that something over 4,000 volunteer hours? Wow, <laughs> that's commendable to the people in our community who are helping to keep us safe. So thank you for helping and working on that too and, and the folks who have worked with you, Grace. Yes, and Grace, uh, thank you for your role and, and all those that support your work and everyone in Cook County for just, uh, we're doing as about as good as you can get <laughs> under the circumstances. So uh, that's something to be, have a lot of gratitude for. And, uh, but it also just helps us all the more for the future, whatever is coming, uh, we're better prepared than we could have been. And uh, so thanks for your part in that. Um, also, let's go to Mike. Uh, any other information or updates that you have? And thanks for joining us this morning, Mike. Sure. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, community members. Our Emergency Operations Center uh, continues to be in operation both at the community center and virtually. I continue to meet with the state and region uh, now uh, twice a month, uh, each of them. Uh, we had, <clears throat> Jim and I had discussions with Grace last week about uh, having uh, what, what, what's known in the emergency management business as a hot wash. Uh, this would be something that would be done after a, an event, a shorter event, or, or after an exercise. And it's usually done as, as soon as possible so you didn't forget everything you did well. A pandemic, this is such an ongoing event that we still want to do this, but we're going to call it a mid-event hot wash. Uh, Jim and I put our heads together and thought an outside person to facilitate this process would be a better a better way to go simply because, uh, you know, we just get a better per perspective because uh, the rest of us here are so close to this event. So I asked our the Arrowhead Region Emergency Management Association uh, hires a planner that to work with all the emergency managers. Uh, in the in the region, and and he agreed to come up to uh, to Grand Marais here and do this for us. So we will we will be sitting down with the minimal a number of people from the ELC to keep uh, things uh, safe in this in person meeting, uh, and uh, we'll go through the hot wash as to how thing what we've done so far, how things are going right now, and what we want to do in the future. And from this, then Blaine will put together a document which is known as an after action report. In this case, we'll be calling it a mid event after action report. It'll be a very useful document that we can use, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, very much looking forward to that. Uh, last week, uh, We've had a planned, uh, the, the region along with the state have had a, a, a long planned exercise to, uh, with the scenario of a line three pipeline, oil pipeline, um, civil unrest type situation. Obviously this was supposed to be a boots on the ground, uh, in person on site exercise and because of COVID we we did it somewhat in person, somewhat uh, mostly virtually. And it was a good test of technology that we have in place in the emergency management world. It went, went really, really well, I, I thought. Uh, uh, and the reason I stay involved with this is, is because in our region, if, if another county needed resources from, from Cook County or myself, that you know that I can keep track um, in real time as to what's going on in a major event like this. So, 
I also met last week with the uh, Minnesota Homeland Security and Emergency Management. They put together uh, what they called a kind of a debriefing for all the emergency managers in the state as to just how things are going uh, during the during the what they're calling a kind of a mid event uh, uh, debriefing too for COVID. And, and some of the big points that came out was that uh, that leadership uh, your, yourselves included, I had very good buy-in right, right from the start. However, uh, a lot of counties thought that their leadership uh, uh, could use a little, a little more training in emergency operations centers. Um, another big one that came out was that a lot of people, we didn't know how this was going to go, so a lot of people didn't ask for for things and help early. So that one of the big bullet points was ask for help early and ask for help often. I, th I think we did a good job here in, in Cook County, but in one of the main bullet points moving forward is that there's a lot of concerns uh, regarding mental health in the, in the future, should this thing go into the the winter months when when other you know when things get kind of slow down and, and people are at home more anyway uh, so that was a that was a major consideration that something maybe we should be looking at also as as winter draws near so that's what i have for you folks today okay questions or comments uh start with commissioner dukirk <coughs> Hey, Mike, uh, the comment on commissioners or leadership needing more incident command training. When I was elected, uh, one commissioner had to have the IC training from FEMA. Is that still the case? Yes, it's re it's recommended. Yes, for sure. The, the Some of the conversations, Heidi, was that there's, and, and as what's happening this year again with elections, there, there's such a turnover and sometimes that training gets forgotten and I, and I think it's something that we can just keep up on. Yeah, so you're gonna put together a plan for that because I think I'm the only one on the board right now with IC training. Yes, for sure. Okay, just for the rest of the commissioners, it's a pretty simple online, easy training. Uh, when I started the recommendation was the IC 100, which is the first level and I actually am at uh, level seven for my training, so. Um, it's really yeah. worthwhile to take that. They're, they're pretty painless. They are painless. Excuse me, just for, but point of a clarification, I know that uh, Commissioner Starley and I, I went through two levels, but you're saying there's a level beyond? I think yeah, it, it, there's I went really, through 700. Yeah, there's one, two, seven, and eight you can all take online, and then there's there's, there's 300 and 400 that are in-person trainings nowadays. Okay, all right. You, there, you can just keep going right on up if you're- How do we get that personal training then? We'd have to attend some kind of conference or? Yeah, yeah, it's offered. Well, it used to be offered <laughs> in person. It's uh, 300 is, is real common now. People, that there's people around the region that are trained that may be willing to come right up here and do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just There's options. Point of clarification. Thank you. Um, Myron, I got mine through the Futures Task Force. So there's multiple ways to get okay. that. All right. That's thank all I for, have. Thank you for offering that, uh, Commissioner Dukert. Um, Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mike, for the update. And um, really grateful that you're doing the the hot wash, I think that's that's really important at this stage, um, just because, like you said, it's been going going on for a long time now, and um, um, also, like you said, I'm got concerns about mental health going into this season and this this upcoming winter, and um, I think it's just a good a, a good point to to go through that. Um, so um, please, please let us know how that how that goes and and what we how we can improve and what we can learn there. Uh, and yeah, look forward to more of the information on the IC training. 
Uh, I think that's all. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mills. Commissioner Story. Um, thank you. And thank you, Mike, for uh, reminding us about the IC training. Um, I might be at level three. Is there any way to find out? Is there a system that we can go into to see what we've done? There should be, yes. I haven't been in it for a while, but it, okay. where, where you find the training, I think you have to set up an account. I think you can go back in and, and request oh. your transcript. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put that on my uh, to-do list later. My to-do list is kind of big right now. <laughs> okay, Thanks. thank you. Well, go ahead, Commissioner Starley, were you finished? Finished. Okay, thank you. Again, thank you too, Mike. Uh, you both make a great team for us in Cook County. And, and uh, here again, we're in about as good a shape as we can, except that maybe we as commissioners got to step up a little bit more and do our part. And thank you for providing that information and opportunity. Okay, uh, we will go on to the EDA. Budget request and welcome, Mary. You've been with us. Uh, I've seen your friendly face and <laughs> on our screen. So thanks for joining us this morning and actually uh, being in attendance for our meeting thus far. And you're certainly welcome to stay till the end if you, if you, if you have the time. So I'll turn it over to you at this time for our budget and levy request. And we have the executive director with us, uh, Mary Somnus. Uh, welcome, Mary. And I'll turn it over to you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair and commissioners for having this on your agenda this morning. Um, I know that the budget request is included in your meeting packet. Um, it's a pretty straightforward uh, budget request in keeping with the way that we've been doing our work at the EDA. We're not asking for any increase this year. We're asking for the same levy as 2020. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, and you can see um, in addition to our levy request, we have $550,000 in funds that are coming from other sources to fund projects, a large part to, from IRRB. Um, we receive $35,000, we're, we're anticipating $35,000 from the Northland Foundation to pay. Pat Campanero's salary under for her work under the SBDC. Um, and then our expenses are just pretty much again straightforward based on our history. Um, you know, as far as operations and staffing, and then um, the projects, many of the projects are again tied back to the funding sources from IRRB. That's what the money is for. Um, we did receive a $30,000 grant from the Northland Foundation to help the property owners that were impacted by the fire in Grand Marais. We're currently meeting with them and looking at preliminary ideas about how they might move forward in rebuilding those businesses or, or whatever might be built on that, those properties. Um, and then one of the one of the other big pieces that I just would point out in our work plan for next year, um, we received a grant of two hundred fifty thousand dollars from IRRB. We're re required to match it with a hundred thousand dollars, and we will be able to do loans for businesses um, with that three hundred and fifty thousand dollars to help provide operating uh, working capital to help businesses get through the winter. So we're hoping that that those funds will be able to help some help some businesses get through this next tough season that's coming, you know, when revenues are slower coming in. Um, and then the last page of the uh, what we submitted for the packet is just a summary of some of the projects that we've completed over the last couple of years and a look ahead at 21. We are working with a developer that has the potential to uh, begin construction of an assisted living facility in Grand Marais this year. Um, Headstrom Lumber is working on uh, 
developing workforce housing and I'm working with Tina there seeking some um, grant funds to help support the infrastructure for that project. Um, again, the, the fire recovery fund. And then we received a grant from the Minnesota Housing Partnership. I don't know the dollar amount, it's technical assistance. They're providing their staff to work with us in the county and the city. And I'm just beginning to have this conversation with uh, folks at Grand Portage as well to create an HRA, which is a Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Uh, I don't quite understand all the benefits of that yet, but I know that it does bring additional opportunities to us to help addressing the housing need, which we heard so eloquently in that letter during public comments this morning. You know, I think we're all very aware of that challenge. It's just finding the solutions is, is a never ending, um, it's a challenge. And um, so the HRA I think is gonna help us with that endeavor. So um, I guess with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Mills. Questions, comments? Go thank ahead. you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, thank you Mary. Um, yeah, just really, really happy to hear about uh, the, the, the HRA side of things. Um, I think that's, that's definitely worth, worth pursuing and um, in finding how we can leverage our resources to, to better serve our community. And, uh, and really, really want to in, encourage any, any uh, work in that, in that area. Um, because I see I see housing as our our greatest need, obviously. Um, I just appreciate the update in general. Um, I uh, I'll I'll I'm really happy to see the community relief relief from IRRR too, and and happy that to to be matching that to try to help um, help the the businesses in need here that are are getting hit, and we know they are so. Um, just thank you for your work and thank you for sticking with us here and um, look forward to uh, more updates on the HRA. Over. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mills. Commissioner Storley. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, so there have been four lots in Cedar Grove sold and four pending. Well, that's good. Um, will there, after those eight, will there be anything left? Yes, Commissioner Sterling, we have um, around 20 more uh, lots that are available for sale. Okay, okay. Well, that's, it's moving along. That's good. It's moving yeah. along. Has there been any word um, from One Roof Housing that they would be willing to come up again and work on some apartments by any chance? Yeah, thanks for asking. They do wish to build apartments on the land that they purchased in Grand Marais at the Nordic Star development. They have enough land there and they'd like to maximize on their investment in purchasing that property by building apartments. But as you know, with just COVID and the way things are right now, they are, they're still um, preparing their work plan for 2021. We're on the list of possibilities, but I have not received confirmation that they're ready to move forward yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. At least we're on their list. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Ducur. <clears throat> no questions. Okay. Uh, I would just like to comment. To thank you for all the work in, in this uh, housing re uh, HRA thing, I think it's a big, big move for us that might be helpful. I attended a session on it with AMC a couple of years ago, and it seems like that could provide some structure to better, you know, meet some of the needs in our community. But I, I but I really appreciate your willingness and for your organization as well to really give some serious consideration to that. And, the more that we can work with other entities, uh, all the better, because I agree with uh, Commissioner Mills, this is our greatest need in Cook County right now is affordable housing. And, and so high emphasis on 
encouragement for continuing that. <laughs> okay, so I think then it would be appropriate to, if there are no more questions or comments, uh, we would approve this budget. So I'd entertain a motion to do so. This is Commissioner Mills. I'll move to approve the EDA budget. Over. Okay. Do we have support? Storley support. Okay. Thank you. Do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim is an aye. Pass us unanimously. Thank you so much again, Mary. And thank, pass on the thanks at your next board meeting to all those. And I know Commissioner Duke Kirk has done a great job working with you as well. And so keep up the great work. I look forward to going on. Thank you, Commissioners, for your support of this um, budget request. And uh, I would just, if I could add, in our initial meeting with the Minnesota Housing Partnership about the HRA, um, Rena attended representing the county and Mike Roth for the city. And um, I am reaching into the Grand Portage community to learn who would be the best representative to join us. I'm going to make sure that I keep um, information flowing to both the county and the city because th this will be another like joint powers like the EDA is. It will be another entity that brings us all together and it's going to take all of us working together to, right. to uh, enjoy the benefits that the HRA is going to bring. So stay tuned. <laughs> That's what it takes is collaboration and cooperation. Yeah, thank you for yeah. taking, and it needs leadership definitely. And thank you for your leadership. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to stay with you in your meeting, but I'm going to head out to the to the to-do list over here on the desk. Okay. That's understandable. <laughs> All right. Thanks Have a good again. Day. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Okay, we'll go to uh, land services. And the first item uh, is an interim use permit request to allow temporary placement of a sauna on property adjacent to Bow Lake. And we did receive that PDF to look at. So I'll turn it over to Bill Lane, I believe, on that one. Is that yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, oh, Commissioners. Morning. Um, uh, Adventures Christians has a uh, recreational facility up on Bow Lake. They got a, they had a, the misfortune of losing their sauna and office building in 2019 to a fire. And uh, through that process, they came into the Planning Commission and Board of Commissioners last year and received an interim use permit uh, for the temporary use of a sauna, portable sauna to replace uh, on an intermittent basis, the, uh, the lost sauna. Everything was going swimmingly. They got a variance to uh, rebuild their sauna and office facility uh, and everything was going swimmingly as I suggested until COVID came along. And once COVID came along, there was uh, uh, obviously, their entire recreational calendar had been uh, destroyed and, and they were unable to build the variant. So what they did uh, upon expiration of the original 2019 IUP is came to land services and requested a new permit um, to allow continued use of that temporary sauna. Um, the planning commission discussion basically was uh, favorable and amenable to the request. The only issue was there was a, a suggestion to extend that interim use permit until uh, October 1st of 2021 with the belief that by that time the sauna would be constructed and everything else would be good. Um, as suggested in the packet in the photos, this is a very innocuous sauna, it's maybe three or four people at the most. Uh, they don't have shower facilities up there and that sort of thing. So for the staff, the sauna uh, is a pretty important uh, component of their, their daily hygiene and that sort of thing. So um, has complete uh, approval of the Cook County Septic Environmental uh, Inspector and uh, was approved unanimously with the recommendation to the Board of Commissioners 
to approve the new interim use permit uh, with its condition. Okay, I'm just gonna open it up, uh, not do a roll call, see how that goes on this item for any questions. So if you could just raise your hand or, or indicate your name and I would uh, call on you to comment or any, any questions or comments from commissioners on this? Okay, then uh, go ahead, Commissioner Starley. Yes, um, just to make sure that I understand that um, it's been renewed on through October of 2021. Correct, yes. Okay, any other questions? Would entertain a motion to uh, approve this as recommended? I will make a motion to um, uh, uh, for the interim use permit for temporarily uh, use of this sauna uh, up through uh, October of 2021. Okay, thank you. Is there support? Support, Commissioner Mills. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mills. Roll call vote, Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim's aye, passes unanimously. We'll go to item B under land services, conditional use permit to construct three remote skiing cabins in FAR one zone district. Go ahead, Bill, I assume this is you as well. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a request from Bob McClellan, who is the proprietor of Bearskin Lodge Cross Country Ski Center. Um, and what this involves is a, a placement of three uh, very rustic shelters adjacent to the Oxcart Ski Trail and Nordic Ski Trail, which of course is a, is a high volume use up here in the winter. Um, so Mr. McClellan came to us uh, earlier this summer and just uh, looked at some of the details that would be involved. It's in the FAR1 zone district, which is our most expansive uh, zone district in Cook County. And it's also surrounded by federal property. He owns uh, approximately 80 acres on this parcel. And the proposed construction was to build 340 square foot primitive shelters, which would involve you know, basically a, a wood stove, no kitchen facilities, and each of the three structures would have a, a portable or a, a private a septic privy vault. So the, the, there's no running water or anything like that. The, the big concern was uh, expressed from adjacent property owners who own property on uh, uh, Aspen Lake. And effectively they were worried about the impact of that on their property ownership. And it was pointed out to, the, to each of the people who responded that the proposed cabins are going to be uh, well over a thousand feet uh, from any adjacent property. And it's limited, limit, the limited use into winter only uh, really takes some of that brunt of uh, an adjacent land use away from the property owners. So, um, you know, once that was brought into the discussion, there was some concern about uh, you know, the, the fact that this is a, a effectively a residential slash recreational parcel and whether there would be expansion in the future and stuff. So what the planning commission did was they crafted an approval based on a, a restricted wintertime use only uh, time frame. So the condition that you see on the draft uh, resolution is that it would extend from mid-December until March uh, every winter. There is no intent to uh, use these during the non-winter months. It would be completely associated with the cross-country ski season and you know winter cross-country skis are called silent sports and that would give a, a pretty good uh, intro of the use of these as a non-impactful use, and it fits within the constraints of the FAR1 zone district. So uh, unanimous vote to approve 
and forward to the Board of Commissioners with the recommendation for your approval. Okay. So any questions <laughs> or comments uh, for Bill Lane on this item? This is Commissioner Mills. Go ahead, Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Bill. Um, was there any discussion around why it would be a problem in the non-winter months? Uh, great question, Commissioner Mills. Uh, no, I think I think the the gist of the discussion was that it would be expanded. Uh, it wouldn't be expanded, and and I don't know. There wasn't any specific, you know, cause and effect mentioned. But the I think the the concern is that this would represent a, you know, a potential expansion of the resort of the Bearskin Lodge and stuff. And so at this point, they just wanted to keep it as a very low profile use. And I think that that was the flavor of their discussion and dis decision. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, I, I, I want to recognize the, the, the nearby property owners concerns with Aspen Lake there. I just with the, the location of the proposed cabins, I, I, I didn't see a and this is not being proposed, but I didn't see the difference between winter and summer use impacts. Um, so I was just curious if that was explored at all, but uh, I guess that's my only question, over. And, and Commissioner Mills, if I can just briefly respond to that. Um, the big thing is, is that with winter use, they have access. Uh, there's a, a lot of wetland back in there that is not a summer access uh, venue. Um, so with, with the, the construction and maintenance and use associated with the grooming protocol and that sort of thing. They ride the groomer through there. They can drop off firewood and that sort of thing. So, so seasonally, it's a really good fit. Uh, referring to the Aspen Lake concern, and that's a, that's a viable concern and was well expressed to me by several property owners. Uh, the big thing is that, uh, you know, there is no intent from Mr. McClellan to expand towards Aspen Lake. And in fact, that would be a, an economically prohibitive use because of the, the uh, wetland components and things like that. The, the closest cabin to the shoreline of Aspen Lake is about 970 feet. And then you have the lake before you get into those adjacent properties. So um, the concern but I think it's been allayed by the fact that it was it was a well thought out plan, and the restrictions established by the planning commission for limited use, seasonal use are are pretty important. Thank you. That that helps a lot. Just clarifying with with the wetlands aspect of of things, I can see where that could uh, get to be challenging or prohibitive with with year round use. So uh, <laughs> thank thank you for clarifying, and that's mm -hmm. that's all for me. Over. Okay, any other commissioners have any comments or questions on this stuff? Then I'll ask for a motion to approve this as recommended. This is Commissioner Mills, I'll move to uh, approve the um, IUP for, or CUP rather, sorry, for McLaughlin. Over. Okay, is there support? Starley support. Okay, thank you. We'll do a roll call vote. Commissioner Duker. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim is aye. Passes unanimously. C, item C under number seven, land services, request for an IUP to establish a fuel facility in the GC zone district in Schroeder. Uh, this I assume is you as well, Mr. Lane? Cor correct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is kind of the redigestion of a uh, interim use permit request that was originally presented okay. to the to your body uh, on July 8th of 2020. Um, it came to the Planning Commission, uh, or excuse me, July 28th, came to the Planning Commission on July 8th and was denied by a four to two vote uh, simply because 
there was a concern that this proposed location didn't have enough supportive uh, uh, information, including an engineer's report. So that was denied by the Planning Commission, brought to the Board of Commissioners on July 28th. And at that meeting, it was uh, tabled by your body and uh, sent back to the Planning Commission with a specific request for the applicant to uh, come up with a specific plan and procedure, which would be an engineered report, which would deal with uh, landscaping, uh, pollution, those all the components which were concerned in the discussion were itemized and presented as a request to uh, Mr. Van Doren to come up with a, a plan and procedure for the site. Uh, came back, brought it back to uh, Mr. Van Doren, uh, didn't receive any comments or any input from him. And I included the two letters that I sent uh, to him just to to remind him of the need to get this addressed within the decision period and that sort of thing. I didn't hear from him, unfortunately. That doesn't rule out that he can't uh, ask again, but the Planning Commission saw this as, uh, as kind of a, a indication that the desire to move forward at this point wasn't there. And so accordingly, they denied the tabled uh, request from the Board of Commissioners and sent it back to you with a final recommendation that you deny the uh, request to establish that refueling facility. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the commissioners on this? Please indicate now. This is Commissioner Mills. Go ahead, Commissioner Mills. Um, yeah, so I. it looks like you've sent two letters out, Bill, to Mr. Van Doren. And um, I, it's it's really unfortunate that um, that there hasn't been a response. I would feel, you know, I I would like I would like some kind of response. I don't want to make any assumptions. Um, uh, no response to me. I, I don't want to I don't want to take a no response as no interest. Um, there's um, lots going on in the world and. Uh, and I would just like some kind of communication, I feel, um, from from the interested parties, um, but there just hasn't been anything. Is that is that right? Uh, that's correct, Commissioner Mills. W one of the things that came up at the Planning Commission meeting was just kind of the, the uh, peripheral communications that have been occurring where it wasn't actually the applicant, it was the applicant's wife who was, who was doing some of the investigatory uh, process, you know, looking at what what needed to be done and that sort of thing. But that decision or the discussion with uh, with Chuck, um, you know, just never occurred. So uh, I, I I agree. I mean, the, the, this is closure on the on the county's perspective, but it may not be closure on the applicant's perspective. And I think that's an important consideration. You know, it hasn't, it, it, it's no secret that we think it's a good idea. It's just the location is challenged. And without that engineer's report, it's, uh, it's, it's just not a, a, a pliable plane at this point. Commissioner Dukirk. Mr. Van Doren had talked to me about it. So um, as Mr. Lane is aware and the board's aware, I was kind of shocked that he hadn't responded to Mr. Lane, that's not okay. Mr. Lane is the contact person for this project to move forward with the board. So, um, you know, Dave, he can reapply, but at this point, I think that we need to close things out and move forward. And so it's, it's unfortunate, but he can reapply. Okay. Yeah, I have one question that pertains to this uh, uh, discussion too, is what is common practice when you do not receive any response from someone when they have an opportunity to do so, it typically mean, means they're not following up. Is that correct or not? Yes, and, and that's the, there, there was an abyss here in communication. And I mean, before the planning commission meeting, I, I, would, I called Chuck and Chuck called me a lot, but once that decision is made, then it becomes kind of the perfunctory communication, here's your letter, 
we have established a time frame on you to, to respond. And beyond that, I mean, we're, we would be kind of creating a special envelope for, for you know, considering an applicant's uh, request and not doing that consistently. So the letter is, the two letters were included in the packet just to demonstrate that, that we established what the criteria were and it was up to, to Chuck to, to follow through and that's where we kind of fell apart. Okay. So I think at this time, I'll uh, share- Mr. Commissioner Mills. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Mills. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Bill, again, and, and thank you, Commissioner Dukirk, for, for the perspective there. What I guess where I was going, and I'm just asking about appropriateness, and it sounds, it sounds like it may not be appropriate, but what I was going to ask is if it'd be appropriate to again table it uh, with the hopes of getting some kind of communication. Um, I, I recognize he, he can reapply, um, but I, I, uh, I would just be much more comfortable if we had some kind of communication there. Um, and maybe, maybe we can't, uh, you know, we just need to stay consistent here and, and, uh, follow procedure. But like I say, there's, there's plenty going on and, um, and I could see, see, um, just some challenges there. Okay, Mr. So that's, Nelson. I guess that's the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are you finished? Mr. Nelson had his hand up and then we'll go to commissioner Storley. Yes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> Sorry, um, the uh, we do have uh, decision deadlines um, that we do have. As Commissioner uh, Dukirk uh, indicated, there is always this opportunity to reapply. Uh, it gets very messy for us to keep uh, tabs on uh, extending and extending and extending a decision deadline uh, that we have. It's more appropriate to just go ahead and close the books on an existing application, understanding that that, that individual has all the opportunity in the world to reapply. And if we, if we wanted to, if the board felt um, that they wanted to uh, go ahead and extend uh, special circumstances to the applicant, they could waive the application fee. Uh, but that would be my preference over just lingering on and on and on with continuing an extension of an application that's been several months old now. Okay. Commissioner Starley, you had a comment? Um, yes. Um, yes, Tim, you took the words out of my mouth. I would say um, he can go ahead and apply uh, again for consideration, but then he should have uh, engineer uh, plans and not just go through the same thing that we're going through now. It needs to be a professionally done. And then, um, you know, then uh, we'd be willing to, I guess, look at it. Although I, for me right now, that's not the site for this business. It would be a wonderful business somewhere else, but not at that site. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Dukirk. He did have a professional helping him with this, just to note that for the record, it's just that he did not bring all the information to the table. And what happened during the first meeting was that he had the engineers on the phone or on the Zoom meeting with us. And when questions came up, they answered. And, you know, that stuff needs to be presented in advance so that the board can review all of it. Having that come up at the meeting is just, and that's part of why we sent it back is because that stuff needs to come ahead of the process, not during the process. So he did have an engineering firm with them. Okay, uh, any other discussion on this? Uh, it's Commissioner Mills again. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you all for, for more perspective on that. And, um, and uh, Commissioner Dukirk and, and uh, Mr. Nelson, especially they're following up. Um, so I'm, I'm much more comfortable going on with with uh, proper procedure there, and I'd make a motion to to deny the request at this time. Okay, support. support. That was Commissioner uh, Storley for support. Okay, Dukirk. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. I didn't I didn't hear that very clearly. Okay, so uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk? Aye. Commissioner Bersheim is an aye. 
passes unanimously to deny. Okay, then we go on to a proposed ordinance mm -hmm. amendments. Uh, I believe these are sort of routine procedures that you go through every once in a while to clear up some language and so forth. Is that correct? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is basically a, a housekeeping uh, scenario. When we when we had these provisions in, and we've had them in uh, for a long time, both in our subdivision and our zoning ordinance uh, with regards to septics, that, that predates our septic ordinance. When we adopted our standalone septic ordinance, at that time, we we probably should have gone through and cleaned up these these provisions that were specific to septics, and all this all these changes that are proposed here is just taking those all the any specific uh, reference to septics out of both the subdivision and the zoning ordinances, and simply just references the uh, the septic ordinance. Uh, in each of those other ones. So it's all pointing to the one document, uh, the uh, Cook County Septic Ordinance, and then the Septic Ordinance adopts the Minnesota Rule 7080. So it gets just everything online and more clear instead of having potentially contradictory uh, provisions. So this did go uh, with the public hearing at the Planning Commission. There were no uh, comments that had been uh, submitted, presented uh, at that point in the Planning Commission uh, recommends uh, unanimously to adopt the uh, ordinance amendments. Okay, any questions or comments for these proposed changes, amendments? I would entertain a motion then to adopt them as presented. This is Commissioner Mills. I'll move to adopt the amendments as presented, over. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Early support. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Storley. Do a roll call vote, Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Bershine, aye. Approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we go to the auditor, um, I think we'll just take, uh, it's all right to take about a seven minute break um, and then convene again. Uh, anyone object to that? Okay, we'll uh, reconvene at 9.45. Um, we'll go to Commissioner, excuse me, Auditor Powers. Hi, Heidi. Hi, Mr. Kimmel, how are you? I'm good, how about you? Good, uh, we are still live and the camera's still on. Myron took a few minute break. Okay. So we will be back shortly and then it's time for Brady, which includes time for you. Awesome, hi Brady. He's in there somewhere. Yep, yeah, I see his... Uh... Well, Heidi, it's nice to see you, it's been been too long since I've seen most of my clients. <laughs> yeah. Um, how are things looking across the state? Kind of mixed. Um, you know, we, we actually are really busy right now. Um, the current interest rate environment really helps with both new financings for projects, as well as for refundings like this one we'll be talking about with you this morning. But you kind of wonder about the pipeline, you know, in, in terms of if the, the pandemic and the economic impact of that continues, will, will governing bodies um, still move forward with capital projects, no matter how much sense they make to do? That's kind of the, the big question. But right now we're, we're, we're busy, so we'll just keep on trucking. Well, and it's an election year, so there's always, year, right? you know, what do you do in an election year? So it's kind of right. kind of crazy. It is, yeah. Are you sitting outside, Bruce? 
No, I'm in my, um, this kind of three season, well, okay. technically four season porch in my house, but it's not very well insulated. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty chilly in the winter. Um, it's pretty bright. It's like, yeah, you're outside. Yeah, yeah. It's not a bad place to, to be. I can't, most people are lining it up so that you see the leaves turning behind them, but I just see your house. <laughs> yeah, if I uh, if I turned, I would be afraid I would get the sun glare right in the camera if I turned it. Plus, uh, our leaves are a little behind yours. Most of them are still pretty green down here. Okay. Although there are a few that are starting to go yellow. A third of mine are on the ground right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Have you had a, a hard frost up there yet? I don't, some places might have. We've had frost warnings. My house, it didn't seem like a hard frost. If my car would have been out, there would have been a little frost on the windshield, but I didn't really see any on the ground. Yeah, yeah it's supposed to be up to 82 down here today. A little bit of a heat wave and then and back down again. Yeah, we could we could hit 70. I don't a few years ago I would be tempted on a day like this to jump into Devil Track Lake and I think I've lost that. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a doctor once and I was doing that quite a bit for a few years. Yeah. And he was checking my ears and he said, do you swim in cold water? And I said, what? Yeah. And he said, yeah, why? He says, because this is typical. It starts to build up nod nodules in your ear because apparently the body's trying to keep that ice cold water out of your brain or really? something. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> Apparently, it's something they notice. Huh. Hey, Heidi. There you go, Brady. I do, yeah. Look at that. That's my yard. No, well, I've got. Uh, here, I'll show you mine. Let me stand up. So I'm on a bluff um, in the Summit Hill neighborhood in St. Paul, but I overlook sort of the River Valley. And I don't know if you'll be able to really see the Schmidt Brewery. You know, a, a tree is sort of blocking it, but I have a really cool view of the Schmidt. Oh, yeah. From my backyard. Oh, okay. you're a lucky duck. And then the high bridge, too, especially in the winter when the leaves yeah. are off the trees, I can see some cool stuff. In the wintertime, I have a wonderful view of a communication tower, and <laughs> I love it. Because it reminds you of how fast your internet is. Uh, the communication <laughs> tower allows for lots of connectivity for lots of important things like public public safety and emergency calls. And so I know some people don't like it. And then if you can hear in the background, there's the sound of uh, trucks shake breaking because I'm also near the Gunflint Trail. And I also like that sound, which some people find offensive. So I'm surrounded by all sorts of things that I find to be wonderful and other people don't appreciate. Well, you've got both sides there. You've got the gunflint on one side, and then you've got the, the little road up to the Maple Hill Cemetery on the other side and wilderness beyond, so. Yeah, and the gravel pit, the road went in right across from my house. I like that too. My neighbors up above me now have less noise because the trucks aren't coming from the top of the hill. Well, I like it. My dog likes it. Yeah, you've been walking up there. How far up have you gone? Well, we go up over Coyote Ridge and down that road and back. There are more people this year parking and walking up on the road. You're not the only one. There are people walking everywhere this year. Yeah. Well, on our road, there's locals. It's mostly locals. I don't see a lot of tourists coming up and down, which is kind of strange considering the historic church up there. But yeah, this is 
in one way, it's good for some people are getting uh, more exercise than they typically do this summer. I'm not going to name names, but the one that I've seen as much as I've seen you is uh, do any day now. So I think that walking is to try and uh, <laughs> get the get the juices going so that baby can arrive. Uh, are you talking about her and her husband? Or yep. Yeah. Yep. She comes up sometimes on her own too. And then I keep an eye because we've got a, a friendly bear up here and some friendly coyotes too. So. Yeah, it seems like she's been in that condition for a long time. Okay, it's uh, 9.46. Oops, I missed it. Um, I've been waiting for Commissioner Mills to pop up. Uh, Commissioner Mills is here. Thank you, wow, okay. Well, let's go on to our county auditor, Mr. Powers, and we'll start with our A uh, item, extension of revolving loan deferral of payments were to approve a resolution as presented with the extension of uh, uh, the revolving loan fund payments. Uh, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah, so the board approved a six month extension uh, back in March, considering the condition of small businesses, the pressure due to the COVID, um, and the committee met again uh, about a week ago to review the current loans and the economic conditions, the short-term outlook, and this is more anecdotal, but given the, uh, the hearing of hardship um, by people like Pat down at the SCDP and others, uh, it seemed wise to extend this. The discussion was to extend it for three months, six months, nine months, get through the winter. And we decided to recommend a three month extension and wait and get more information from uh, property tax payments. How are people doing there? And then, uh, Pat will also do a, um, he's going to do a survey, survey monkey to some of the clients to get, uh, you know, a better idea of how they are doing. And we can get a better look at all of the economic situation and then probably look at this again, you know, by sometime around the end of the year. So the recommendation right now is just to extend it for an additional three months and I put together a resolution as we did that the first time. So it asks for approval of that resolution. Okay, any questions or comments, please uh, raise your hand or indicate your name. Commissioner Story. Thank you, Chairman, and welcome, Bruce. Good to see you again. <laughs> um, I don't have any questions, just a comment that I'm glad um, <clears throat> that you, Bruce, are willing to work with us. Um, as you know, we had the fires um, the end of, uh, after Mother's Day in May and, and um, with the COVID going on, it's, it's just um, reasonable to think that we could look at this again, um, understanding as Brady said, to see how the businesses are doing. And uh, I don't know how we can project that because um, you know, we could be in another lockdown again, or winter's coming, and how will folks um, there again reorganize uh, their businesses for safety and so forth. So thank you for um, being on board with us. Over. Any questions? Any more questions on this item? This is Commissioner Mills. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, Brady. Um, uh, I think it. I think it makes a lot of sense um, to to improve the extension, and um, you know, just to you know, for the public's sake, are there are there any uh, you know, um, what are the risks by by us extending this, the, the the making this extension? It there really isn't much risk. I don't think there's 
were foregoing some interest payments uh, for a few months. Their loans remain in place just as they are, the same principle. The fund is in great shape, so we, uh, we don't miss uh, the additional uh, revenue. We haven't had any applicants, you as you would expect. Um, so I don't, the risk I think more is on the side of maybe pushing some people to uh, give up. Um, and that's where we need to, we're gonna do that uh, uh, survey and just see you know, what the condition is as much as we can. So it seems like the risk is more on pushing people and this is just a way to, uh, to just give them a little time to get their feet together there. Are, I mean, the report is that most of them are getting by on these federal loans and they're not grants. Most of them are loans and those payments are gonna start coming due after the first of the year. So um, there are some that have been making payments, but uh, probably in many cases, it's due to these loans that are now gonna start coming due and where are they gonna get the money to do that? So it just seemed prudent at this point to just extend it a little bit. Thank you, yeah, that helps a lot. I, I, I would concur that I, I feel like the risk is greater with not extending it. Um, and it sounds like sounds like the committee is on the same page there. So that's all for me, over. Okay, hey, Commissioner Dukert, you had your hand up. Yeah, Brady, what percentage of uh, businesses are continuing to pay even though they've been offered this extension? I think about half have made some payments. And thank you. Yeah, and not all of the payments. Yes, I attended that meeting and it, it sounded like a very good thing to do. And I think some people are making some payments on the principal, but um, there's quite a few people that have not made payments like a half. So that's a pretty strong indication that this is very worthwhile. And yes, if we push this, put more pressure on, then I think there would be more consequences of greater risk as well as people going out of business that hopefully will not you know, have to do even though it's gonna be a challenge. You know. And then it will be revisited again. So any more questions or comments or could we ready for a motion to approve this resolution? <clears throat> this is Commissioner Mills. I'll move to approve the um, extension. Over. Okay, do I have support? Support Commissioner Dukirk. Okay, thank you. Roll call vote, Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Bershams, aye. Passes unanimously. Going on to the proposed 2021 county levy, we got a PDF with some models on it um, with various amounts uh, indicated for our preliminary levy. Remember that this is the preliminary levy and we're hopefully I'll make a decision today on what that will be. And then we'll revisit the, this again in December to make a final levy after our truth and taxation meeting, which we also have in our schedule today as well. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Auditor Powers and uh, present any, any information that you have for us at this time. And then we'll go through some kind of a process to see where we can end up uh, with some kind of consensus. Yes, okay. Mr. Chair, uh, the county has to set a proposed levy no later than September 30th. So this is the last scheduled regular meeting. You could have a special meeting if there was more discussion or more information needed before making that uh, decision. We've, we've looked at it um, since beginning of August and at the last meeting. And what I've put in your packet are two things that we will look at it in recent meetings. Um, one dated 9-7-20 with the, the basic budget for all the county departments and it includes a contingency of $250,000 for whatever may be negotiated this fall or any other changes 
uh, that may be made. Uh, it does include a 9.9% health insurance uh, increase, which we do not have any options on. And with this $250,000 contingency, as you see on there, the uh, total dollar increase would be 280,000. 918 with a percentage increase of about 2.71. And then if you look to the calculator, you can see that uh, the tax rate, even with that levy increase of 2.71, uh, there's a increase in our tax capacity this year, as you heard the assessor describe uh, at the last meeting. And so our estimated tax rate is down 4.44%, even with that levy increase. And on the next page, you can see some examples for residential homestead at all the various uh, valuation levels. So this is for your mythical taxpayer who does not have any change in their value from one year to the next, no change at all. Uh, they still have a reduction of about 2%, even with a 3.71 levy percent increase. And the next page is another scenario we looked at with an increased contingency, another 150,000. So now a $400,000 contingency for things that we may approve or things that may happen between now and December. And that results in a $430,000 total increase over last year and a 4.16% levy increase. And the following page shows that calculator again with the $400,000 uh, contingent and the increased tax base. And the next page shows that the effect on it residential taxpayer with no change in value again, even with that 4% levy increase stays about even. It shows just a slight decrease in tax payment of 0.7. So basically um, no effect for the average under that scenario. Um, so the, the question then for the board is, uh, the, these are two examples. You could choose one of those contingencies, something in between, something else, but um, this is going to be your outer limit of your levy for the year. Um, so I guess we're open for questions and discussion. Okay, so would it be fair to say that one proposal would be a slight decrease for the mythical, you know, or, you know, a hypothetical uh, no valuation increases, they would get a slight reduction in their tax and the next one would be sort of everything stays the same with the 400 and some thousand dollar contingency. Would that be uh, a good way to frame the difference between the two, Brady? That that's a that's a pretty good summary. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's open it up um, for your thoughts on what's been presented. I know we've had some discussions on this, um, I'm sure amongst ourselves as well as in various other venues. So um, I would just start with a roll call on for each of us to comment uh, and then we'll see how we proceed from there. So I'll start with uh, Commissioner Dukirk. You're at the top of the list. Uh, if you would like to comment or have any questions or whatever you desire to share with us at this time. Thank you, uh, Chairman Bersheim. Uh, so we have union negotiations going forward and I would just like to remind the board that the past history of previous boards was to set the maximum levy at an amount that did not allow for any adjustment in wages. So um, it's nice to see that all of the work that's been done over the last couple of years sets us <laughs> up so that in the midst of a pandemic and everything else going on, that we can still 
set a reasonable levy, allow for raises, and also not have an impact on the taxpayer. I'm also kind of excited that Brady called a taxpayer with no valuation change mythical. So I'm hoping that I become mythical pretty soon because my property was assessed. Um, obviously in December, we can back off from anything we set today, but I think it's just um, nice to go forward for those in, in employee negotiations to let the employees know that, you know, we're not starting from zero. We're not saying no right off the bat, but it gives a little bit of room. And I'm also hoping that with that olive branch out that they are willing to help us keep the levy low and not have any huge increases in their negotiation process. Um, so it's nice to see we're sitting in a good spot. My gut says go with the 4% because we said if we stay between four and six, then we won't have huge ups and downs. And that included any crazy things happening, even though no one ever assumed the crazy thing would be a pandemic. So I don't know, I'm comfortable with whatever you guys suggest. And I'm glad that the option isn't zero, even though we, probably could be at zero. So that's all I've got. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Duker. Um, Commissioner Storley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I think we um, were very lucky in terms of what we're facing with the pandemic, um, that we have something to work with here. And um, thank you to Brady for providing all this. I think it gives over the last few days a chance for me to look this over in terms of um, setting a reasonable levy now, knowing that we can come down. And um, I guess um, I need more information as we always do about what's going on with property taxes and and, and you know, looking into the future for a lot of things that the county will be facing, but um, I would be, um, I guess I would say, I would be comfortable with something between here, two and four right now. Okay. We can further that discussion, but that's kind of where I am right now. Okay, thank you. But I'll, I'll throw it out there. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mills? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Brady. Um, I largely concur with um, Commissioner Duker. Well, I, I definitely concur about the mythical status. Um, I think we can all appreciate that. Um, but I, I largely concur with Commissioner Duker and, and Commissioner Storley on, on everything here. Uh, I'm really thankful for, for, for being in the situation as, as, as good as we are considering the circumstances a um, couple questions uh, I have for Brady, though, and this is largely for the public and partly for us commissioners as well. But could you just speak a little bit to um, the Ty Blatnick uncertainty at this point and where that fits into our budget? Um, that, just as the first first question. Yeah, so we're waiting. I, be I believe next summer was the target when we uh, thought we'd most likely find out. What the, what the results would be on that. And the, the decision from the Forest Service was that they were going to give us uh, this year and next year our regular payment, which is um, now it's exceeding just over 1.9 million. But if the result came back uh, less than that, uh, we would, we would owe that back because it would go into effect retroactively. So our plan this year is to not include um, that in next year's levy. And because this year uh, was not the start of that. So we included it, but Next year, we would have to hold that back and the following year. And so 
we will do that, um, which could make, if we have to next year, that could make a tougher uh, levy year next year. If we, it, let's say the cut was as big as the initial uh, appraisal, which was $750,000, we certainly don't expect that to come back that way, which is why we're doing the reappraisal. But that's kind of, I would expect would be the worst case is that we would be short that amount. Um, but for the first couple of years, we're reserving that. So we're not putting that into our levy to begin with. Um, we have been helped because the federal government in one of our three types of federal aids, um, payment in lieu of tax, if you will, they've given us extra money for three years in a row. So we've been able to uh, supplement that even with that reduced uh, BWCA, we've been able to supplement that. There's no guarantee that that will happen going forward since they told us that was a one year event um, and it is reducing now. Uh, went from 760 and now dropped to 600 and some. So I'm saying you may be, you may end up on worst case, we could end up, you know, maybe $400,000 short um, that we have to make up next year, but that's probably worst case. And it could come back very positive. Um, we could get exactly what we've gotten for the past 10 years and we could get more potentially depending on how that uh, appraisal comes out. Okay, Thank uh, you, sir. Commissioner Mills, you had, I think yep. you sort of alluded to more questions. So I'm go back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Brady. So yeah, hope for the best plan for the worst. Uh, I don't know what to expect there. Um, but that's just something for us to, to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, Brady, is um, what's going on at the state level um, and, and what has gone on in past uh, hard times as far as um, levy limits are concerned. Um, just, you know, again, to, to hope for the best and plan for the worst, I thought it, it might be. Yeah, good to, to speak about that a little bit. Well, frankly, I haven't heard a lot other than the state is taking a big hit in some areas of their budget. But I haven't heard the word levy limit um, in anything that I've read. And I don't know if any of you have heard that. In the past two that I've been involved in, that recession in 2001, 2002, and then the Great Recession in you know, 2008 and nine, um, it was the levy limit was spoken about a lot in advance and then it got was approved. Uh, so we had several years of levy limits in those years, but we had, there was lots of talk and there was lots of advance warnings, but not a full year warning. It would, those things happen when the, there's a quick downturn. So, you know, it all depends. With this pandemic, it's it's not as fast moving as the dot com bust, two thousand one and two, or the crash, two thousand eight um, and nine when it hit up here. So uh, maybe it will not happen because of uh, because of that and because of the reactions of counties. Maybe. It's, it seems to be a different type um, of event, having different, different types of reactions. Usually levy limits also come in when counties are, are setting relatively higher levies and the state wants to put a stop to that given the condition. So that's, I don't know if that's a helpful answer, but uh, I would say it, Right now, it seems like not a likely, maybe even a remote chance, but it's a possibility. And we're doubtful going to know before we set our levy this year. So it's just something to have in the back of your mind. Okay. Thank you. And 
Oh, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So what I was was hoping to to why I was hoping to bring that into the conversation was just my understanding of of how the levy limits work is that um, it's based on your previous levy and you cannot exceed that. And so whereas of course we want to keep the levy low, if we're potentially hitting this worst case scenario with the federal PILT payments um, and there's the possibility of a hard time from the state, which what I'm hearing from AMC is that things are, are pretty rough at the state level uh, financially. Um, then, then we don't want to uh, put ourselves in a situation where our our, our hands are, uh, you know, shackled. Um, and and so I don't want to, you know, I want to I want to be prudent. Um, and, and and what that means in my mind is going with this this upper limit contingency. Um, both Commissioner Dukirk and Commissioner Storley had mentioned, you know around the, the four percent uh, commissioner Storley said two to four percent i just want to point out that uh it looks like with that full four hundred thousand contingency we've got a 4.16 percent um levy increase and that again still keeps our our mythical uh property owner at at a a, a negative 0.7 uh percent change on the on the dollars uh from the pocketbook there um and so i think you know that's a pretty reasonable amount um and i think it, it puts us in a, in a in a careful uh a careful position for a lot of the uncertainty that's that's going to be that's here and and what's going to be going into the future so um that's what i think would be would be best at this point but again i'm very open to to talking more about it over and, and you're right and you're right that uh, that's how they've done it in the past to set it on the previous levy um and they do allow certain um certain aspects to exceed that levy it's very complicated if you want to get exceptions to those limits we've not fared well i've gone through a lot of steps to try and get um, additional levy through the exceptions, but um, they don't typically hit us. It's it's not significant. So we would be um, essentially limited to the previous levy if it's handled the same way. Bob, you've had your hand up, but I uh, do you want to go before I have my turn here? <laughs> I guess it's up to you. I just want to, you know, throw out an, there's another variable out there that that we haven't talked about. Um, I don't think anything will happen for this year's assessment with the vacation rentals. I, I think that that window is kind of closed. I suppose anything can happen if, if the state makes a change legislatively. Next year, if, if that bill does pass, then you'll be having some ground to make up because right now with some of these as commercially classified property, they're going to pick up more of the tax burden. So when if they do, if, if this bill passes next year for 2021 assessment, a, 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 let's just a hypothetical two or a 4% levy then would, would you know have a bigger impact on with the lost tax capacity from commercial going back to residential. So that's one thing, I mean, and, and it's not completely off the table this year. Um, you know, I guess anything could happen that they, they keep continuing the special sessions I think we're, they, they did the fourth one um, about 10 days ago. So I would expect another one to be called in October to ex extend the emergency declaration powers. And, um, you know, anything I suppose could happen, but that's another variable that you have to, to consider in this is that you may be um, going backwards on tax capacity next year um, or even this year if they change something down in St. Paul. So what you're saying to clarify this, at least for me, is that whether uh, if we get our uh, two percent, let's just say hypothetically, or the four percent, uh, you're saying that we're going to have less bang for the buck going forward if this happens, and therefore it's better to go high, higher. 
I we're guess I can't more. say if it would be better or worse, but what, what I am saying is that if, if there was a loss in tax capacity due to a legislative change, then the numbers wouldn't be as favorable on the taxpayer's bill in the end, if, if that makes sense. It would be the opposite of what happened with when, when we shifted the vacation rentals to residential from seasonal, it, there was that additional tax capacity that they then picked up more of the levy. This So now this year it's it's continued. There's 170 some properties that went commercial. So they're, they're now picking up more of this levy. And if a legislative change were to happen, then it would just you know kind of go back to the other taxpayers, but it wouldn't be devastating. I, I don't think there was much of an increase from the commercial changes because with the increase in commercial changes, there was a loss in, in the other 400 and some going to residential or going back to seasonal rec. So, but yes, that the, the, the um, interpretation that shooting on the high side, I mean, given that this is a, a, a tentative um, levy that you're setting today, shooting on the high side um, is, is uh, uh, in my opinion, a wise choice, because if something were to change, let's say in October, if something were to change, we couldn't even give you an estimate of what, what that would have an effect on the, on the budget and the levy and the, and the tax bills, unless we had actually gone in and made those changes in the system, it would, we would have to change all 600 and some records. Okay. All right. Well, I would like to comment. Uh, if any other commissioners want to add anything now, I'll just go to myself, I'm usually last. I think I'll be a little bit of the a devil's advocate here, just, just to raise a point of view and not to be obstinate or, or be in disagreement, but uh, having been on the budget committee, it's my fourth year working on this. I'm not an expert, but I've got some familiarity with it. And I'm a product of my experience in working with budgets in public schools and have gone through some times and uh, did some research on my graduate level work on budgeting. And so uh, I would like to just say that this is a time that's a little unique. Uh, we've, we've worked on the budget and we've done a great job as a county um, and thanks to everyone for that. And that's very worthwhile. Our finances from my perspective are, have been in about the best condition that I've been aware of. Uh, for a long time in the county. Um, and because of the pandemic, we've actually saved some money and we've enhanced our budget. Our reserve is at 90% and uh, we have passed a resolution that we should try to keep it at 75. And uh, at one time that would have been a, a goal. So we're doing quite well, in fact, maybe better than I had anticipated at least uh, three, four years ago, but we made some really good corrections and then we've had some good things happening. I believe that last year's levy, I supported it because of the thigh blotnik uncertainty and therefore I think we positioned ourselves fairly well uh, by putting this money in reserve uh, in case we get a worst case scenario. Um, on the decision coming forward and having worked on that, I, I think there's some hope there if uh, a good reappraisal takes, a, takes place. So um, also I think when we, we get into these kinds of situations like the pandemic, we have to take a look at the point of view of the taxpayer as well. And uh, so yes, the 4% would be sort of harmless on that mythical or hypothetical uh, taxpayer. A lot of, a lot of people, a lot of properties will increase. I know my, all mine have, but um, in considering that, I, I lean more toward the 2%. Uh, I had gone into this whole thing looking at, and quite frankly, still could be convinced to go with no increase in levy and other entities have done that. Um, I'm into risk aversion, pretty pretty big uh, from my point of view. So I, I don't think I would propose something that would be irrational as far as risk, um, but I could be wrong in my perceptions as well. Um, I think the 2% is giving everyone a little bit of a break on that hypothetical level. 
and uh, I would tend to support that more than the four. The four would be a great thing to do if we did not look at the taxpayer's perspective. But I think uh, we represent the public and it's just the public's money. And at times, I, I, I really think that that's an important issue when, when you're in a pandemic. That's, so my typical strategy, at least from my point of view in going about setting budgets has changed because of the pandemic. And that's why I think the 2% gives us enough cushion. Uh, we've, if we went from 90% to 80% in our reserve right now, that would mean about $1.4 million. Is that correct, Brady? And so we have, we have some movement there that if times really get tough, we, we've got a little bit we can work with. We've set aside the five Blotnik. We're cushioned fairly well, but I want to confirm that with the auditor, the 1.4 million, did I recall that correctly? That's pretty close. Okay, all right. So my point being is that we're positioned pretty well, I think, to go to the 2%, 4% would be ideal. But um, I, I think that for me, it'd be a compromise to go to 2% in these conditions. Um, I would lean more toward a zero percent, but that's from my past experience. But I think I, I easily could convince. I am convinced on a two percent as a wise thing to go forward because things can happen between now and December. But I think I'm just sending the message that uh, we should keep this as low as possible, and two percent, and still protect ourselves for the future. Commissioner Mills, I I see a response on your phone, or am I misreading that? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm largely in agreement with you if we were talking about the final levy, but for the preliminary levy, I think the most prudent course of action is the 4.18%. We can always bring it down later, but we can never bring it up once we set the preliminary. And considering a lot can happen between now and December, I think that's uh, it protects the taxpayers from uncertainty, it, it, it protects the, the county organization from uncertainty and just gives us um, uh, room to maneuver, which in these uncertain times, I think maneuvering is of the utmost importance. Over. Sure. Thank you, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, any other questions, comments, or and then we'll uh, go to the motion phase. Uh, Commissioner Starley? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, you know, you always need new information and what Bob talked about, that's the new information that I really hadn't placed in this picture. So, um, you know, I just feel that if we go too low and we get something back from the state on what would cause us to reconsider, we wouldn't have any cushion to do it over okay my response to that is that we do have a very good reserve that's all and but i respect what you're saying i um anyone else okay then we'll entertain a motion uh, to see how we proceed i'll uh, make a motion to i'll make a motion to set the levy at 4.16 okay uh we have a motion by Commissioner Duclerc, do I Second. support? Okay, yep. support. Commissioner Mills. Okay, very good. So we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Duclerc. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Starley. Aye. Commissioner Versheim goes no, nay. Uh, I do respect what you're doing. Uh, and uh, I just feel like 2% is as I presented uh, uh, as far as I would go at this point in time. But certainly we can look at this in the future and I'm sure it's a lot of good rationale for what you're doing. I'm not, uh, I just feel I should vote uh, on the 2% at this time. But uh, that's a no. And, uh, and then we do approve this uh, three to one. And so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, the next item is uh, at the same meeting, 
where you approve a proposed budget and levy, you have to set the time, announce the time and place for the truth and taxation meeting. The TNT meeting can occur between November 24th and December 28th and must not end before 6 p.m. So what we've done recently um, is to hold that meeting in early December. We had been holding it in late November, but it sometimes ran into uh, the holidays. And uh, so in deference to that, we moved it to the first week of December. So that's just some history. Um, and I'll just say December 1st is a Tuesday in 2020. Okay. So let's, um, any, anyone opposed to the uh, date as uh, December 1? That was in our agenda. <clears throat> no problem with that. So I would entertain a motion to uh, go ahead with December 1 for the truth and taxation. So moved, Commissioner Dukirk. Thank you, Commissioner Dukirk. Do we have support? Board, Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Roll call vote. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Duker. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim. Aye. Passes unanimously. And we'll go on to the sales tax revenue refunding bonds. And we have Bruce Kimmel with us. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us. And I'll turn it back to a Brady to start this off, and I'm sure that Bruce will be giving us some information. And Brady, I think uh, when you make your presentation, I would ask that you sort of make a recommendation to us uh, that we could uh, react to. Is that is that fair way to proceed? Yeah, I think we'll uh, let Bruce make his presentation first, and I'll just preface that we have uh, sales tax bonds from 2011 and 2012 that uh, that we use for the uh, 20 million dollars of projects, and those two bond issues um, can be uh, refunded starting in uh, 2023. But in this case, uh, Ellers always contacts us with the outstanding issues. If interest rates have reduced enough so that it looks like we can gain an advantage by um, uh, refunding the issues now. And so they've done that analysis. And uh, I think I'll just let Bruce take it from here. Okay. Thanks for joining us, Bruce. Good to see you again. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Bruce Kimmel Thellers, and happy to be with you. So as, as Brady mentioned, we've been keeping an eye on your 2011B and 2012B uh, sales tax revenue bonds payable with your local option sales tax. Um, these are both general obligations of the county. So ultimately you're pledging also your full faith and credit, but um, as you know, these bonds are payable solely with the 1% sales, the sales tax dollars that you collect. And both of these bonds, even though they were sold in different years, are callable in February of 2022. And so knowing that um, the county has been amassing uh, a, an accumulation of surplus funds above and beyond what it needs for debt service on the existing bonds, and knowing that we are in a historic low interest rate environment, we've been talking with Brady over the last several weeks to come up with a proposal that would make sense in terms of both taking advantage of the low interest rate environment, but also applying quite a bit of the amassed uh, revenues to buy down the refinancing and, and achieve uh, greater, even greater savings for the county. So that's what we've reflected in this pre-sale report. And I will just go through some of the highlights with you on this. What, what I would also mention though is um, Brady and Kelly uh, in the auditor's office have been raising some great questions about possible mm -hmm alternatives, um, possible different ways we could approach this refinancing and redemption of the existing bonds. And what I would ask is that you consider the resolution in front of you ultimately, which gives us the green light to move forward with the refinancing, but with the understanding that the um, ultimate structure and, and what exact parts of the bond issues are included may change based on some additional analysis that we're doing this week. We just essentially ran out of time um, to come to a conclusive, you know, decisive answer as to exactly what is gonna be the best option for the county 
given all of these different variables and in considerations, but we also don't want um, to miss the opportunity to bring this for your consideration and to get your green light, if you will, to move forward. So I'll go through this, uh, again, this baseline uh, proposal or, or a structure that we think would make sense for the county based on what we know now. But again, with the caveat that um, we would ask you to essentially give uh, auditor powers the ability to change course if additional analysis makes sense to do that. Uh, so with that preamble, let me just jump in with some of the highlights. I'm referring to the pre-sale report that was in your uh, board packets. And I won't go through all the details, but I mentioned again that we're looking at doing advanced refundings of the 2011B and 2012B bonds. I should note that um, the uh, Tax uh, Reform Act that was passed by Congress a, a couple of years ago took away the ability of, of uh, municipalities to do tax exempt advanced refundings. So this is a, a taxable advance refunding because we are more than three months out from the call date that will be in, in 2022 for both of these bond issues. You might think, well, how can we afford to do a taxable uh, refunding when you know, ordinarily we, we issue tax exempt bonds? And it's really, again, a function of the current interest rate environment. Um, there's such a, a small spread or difference right now between taxable rates and tax exempt rates because rates overall are so low that is actually, it's, it's, it's still a, a big advantage we're seeing in terms of doing this refinancing on a, on a taxable basis. Plus, I should point out that the 2012 B bonds, which financed your contribution to the broadband project with Arrow, uh, Arrowhead, um, that, that was a taxable financing to begin with. So we're really only losing the tax exemption, if you will, on the 2011 B portion and not the 2012 B portion. Uh, and again, because of the interest rate environment, it's not really even a loss um, in terms of your ability to lock in very advantageous interest rates. So with that, uh, that explanation there, um, I won't go through too much on the authority. As you know, you had a special piece of legislation that gave you the ability to finance projects with the local option sales tax. And this is really just a continuation of that. Moving on to the next page. We are looking to shorten the overall term by two years. Um, so the final maturity on both bonds or on, on the overall bond issue would be in 2033. Um, previously, the 2012 B bonds went out to 2035. So we are shortening this up by two years as part of this refunding structure. The county has a AA rating with S&P. Uh, we would expect an affirmation of that AA rating. Really don't see any stress on the county's rating, uh, even with the pandemic. And we have been through quite a few rating processes during the pandemic. So we know the types of questions that they'll be um, you know, wanting to ask the county and we'll be, be sure to prepare accordingly with, with uh, Auditor Powers and his team uh, for that. So uh, moving on, let's see if there's anything else specific in the narrative that I wanted to call out. You have uh, issued bonds via competitive sales structure in the past. We certainly are seeing a, a, a lot of very aggressive bidding from underwriters uh, in the current marketplace. Even with these low interest rates, they're very eager to buy bonds and we think this bond issue will be ex extremely well received. So we would recommend a competitive uh, sales structure for this as well. And the rest is pretty much standard discussion of things like continuing disclosure, arbitrage, monitoring, investment of proceeds. One thing I would mention here is the county can certainly look at options for um, uh, uh, investing the bond proceeds in the refunding escrow um, on its own. But we also have some expertise in-house at Ellers in terms of looking at how best um, to finance or, or to reinvest uh, bond proceeds until they're needed, in this case, in, mainly in 2022 when the bonds are callable. And so we'll be providing Brady with some information as to what options are available and, and then the county can decide whether they want to engage us to help with the investment of those proceeds. Finally, I would note, you know, as was is, is always the case with sales tax revenues, there is some risk of volatility. We are structuring the future debt service well below the average of one and a half million dollars that you've received over the last nine years. Um, and even this year, you, you look to you know be doing 
even with the dip, you're, you're not down that much. Um, and we, we are anticipating that the new debt service on these bonds would be less than a million dollars a year. So if you look at your average of a million and a half in collections and this new debt service of a million, you know, hopefully you feel confident that you've got some cushion there, um, even if the, the pandemic uh, impacts on the economy were to continue for some time to come. Then the only other thing I would just note here is that um, moving on to the calendar, the debt service or issuance schedule, you can see that we're here having this conversation on September 22nd. We would look to have the uh, rating agency discussion the week of the 12th. I think we're actually already scheduled for October 13th on that. Look to sell the bonds uh, most likely on Monday the 26th with award at your at your board meeting on October 27th. And then we would have a closing uh, in the end of November with again, then about 14 months before the redemption of the 2012 or 2011 B and 2012 B bonds. Finally, Mr. Chair and commissioners, um, uh, if you scroll forward a couple pages, what I really wanted to focus your attention on is, um, let's see, it's page in your packet, it's page 134 of 149. This is the uh, projected savings when you compare your existing debt service to your new debt service. And I wanted to call this out because it's a little bit confusing due to the expected use of about $2.8 million in accumulated local option sales tax revenues for this refinancing. And so if you look in that savings column, you can see there's quote negative savings of about $2.7 million. What that really reflects is the use of $2.8 million of cash. And even with that, there's about $100,000 or $95,000 of savings in that first period ending 2-1 of 21. But our, our bond structuring program sees that $2.8 million as being money that you could spend somewhere else on, on public works vehicles or for human services or you know, general administration. And as you all know, you can't use that local option sales tax money anywhere else. And, and this is something that I wish we could find a better way of conveying because it is confusing. But what I would just point out is that if you look beyond that, you can see that we're estimating about $150,000 of savings annually through the period ending 2-1 of 33. And then because we are eliminating the debt service on the 2012 B portion completely in the last two years, you can see that that's why we're showing savings of one point, roughly 1.3 million in each of those years. And so if you add up all the positive numbers in the savings column, that gets you to about 1.7 million, as you can see in the totals line. But really, because again, you can't use your sales tax dollars for anything other than this purpose, we think it's appropriate to essentially back out that negative 2.7 million number. If you do that and you add up all the numbers, you can see that it, it adds up to about 4.4 million of total savings. And so that's really, really the, the true day-to-day -day impact is with this refunding structure as we have it currently and with interest rates that we, you know, are, are reflective of the current rate environment, we, we believe that the, the county would save roughly 4.4 million in total debt service by applying $2.8 million of accumulated, accumulated revenues, plus taking advantage of the current rate environment and structuring the debt service by two years. So that was a really long run on sentence, but I wanted to um, share that with you and, and why if you look at that savings column, it doesn't really give you the full picture. Then the last thing I would just note is again, um, Brady and Kelly have been asking some great questions about, well, what if we you know, don't use the $2.8 million and apply that just to paying off one of the bonds in the year 2022? We think actually based on um, our understanding of the, the deal mechanics that that would not be a material benefit, but um, 
there's enough moving pieces here that I don't want to say that conclusively until I can run the numbers with my analytical team and really compare apples to apples. So um, we, we certainly want to run that to the ground and make sure that we give careful consideration to any other possible changes. Um, we did look at um, possibly using all of the cash on one bond issue versus the other, and that had less of an impact than I would have thought. So there's, there's, there's a few things here that we just want to put to bed, if you will, um, before we, we nail down the final structure and say, okay, we're going to the market with this structure. But hopefully this, this uh, presentation gives you enough confidence that we are you know, really covering the bases and looking at every possible opportunity to maximize savings for the county, to shorten the debt service term, to reduce the debt service even, by, even when we're shortening it, and to save the county upwards of $4.4 .4 million. So let me step there and ask what questions you might have about this proposed refunding. And uh, is there any more comments from you, Auditor Powers, before I go to the commissioners? Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the same schedule <clears throat> and just looking at it, you know, a, a, probably a little less technically than Bruce, where, where my eyes go is, um, I know technically it doesn't match, but my eyes go to that negative number. We're using the 2.8 million but then you go right to the bottom and you've got 2.5 million of that debt service disappears on the bottom. And that's a simplistic way to look at it, but I see that that way. And, and then I look at the savings year by year. So you see anywhere from 134,000 to 216,000 of reduced debt service. And those are payments we'll be making <laughs> from that sales tax fund each of those years. Um, and even before the proposal used 2.8 million, we were showing uh, about 98,000 a year in savings on the debt service. So the 2.8 helps shorten it and it helps um, just that reduction in debt service. So um, if you look out just for future who knows what happens with sales tax in the future. We've done very well with it, but we've got reduced debt payments and we can lock those in. We've got a really healthy fund balance holding with 1.2 million. We're starting at one and a, over one and a half million, which of course will take a dip this year. Uh, it, it dipped in uh, May, uh, April, May, of course, and then it came back uh, significantly for a month, we'll probably see that again for a couple of three months, and then we'll probably see dips again in the fall, et cetera, and in the winter. But um, don't expect that to continue more than a, than a year, let's say. So overall, it makes sense, I think, to take advantage. And then the question is just which is the best way? So, so they are going to analyze for us whether using the 2.8 now uh, in this manner, or whether we should look at uh, like one of the debt issues with the higher interest, potentially waiting, using that debt um, in 2022 to take that out, just, just to know which is the best advantage. So I think we want to take ad advantage of the low interest rates. So it's just a matter of exactly which, which way makes the best uh, financial sense. Okay, so procedurally, I think what we're doing today is we'll hopefully seek authorization for you to pursue this uh, on some basic premises. My question would be, would you come back when you work out these fine details to get further approval or are we going to just authorize you to, to make that decision? Mr. Chair, I would recommend that you authorize us to work with uh, auditor powers to make that decision. I, I don't think that one course or the other is going to have a material difference. Really, we're still looking to only, you know, only make a change if it can really improve on the over four million dollars of estimated savings, or if there's another procedural or, or you know, op operating reason why it makes sense for the auditor's office to to do that as it relates to you 
using or holding on to the, the lost revenues. Um, so I don't think there's a, um, a substantive change at work here other than just a, a possible tweak to the, the, the mechanics. Okay. One thing I would say is, you know, certainly um, we could include that in your board packet as an informational item for the next meeting based on the decision we make later this week. Okay. But I would like us to, if, if you're comfortable with this, to move forward with urgency <laughs> towards that late October sale date. Okay. Thank you. That seeking some clarification. So good. So we'll open up to the discussion and based upon the that we would authorize this to go forward because of the timing. Okay. So questions or comments. Um, let's. Um, anyone want to raise their hand or indicate uh, their desire to comment or ask a question. Okay. So great. So I'd entertain a motion. Then well, to I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I was just being patient. Thank you for your, uh, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and so let's see here, we've got 1.2 in our reserves for local option sales tax payments, correct, Brady? If we use, if we go forward with this plan, we'll have 1.2 to 1.4, uh, something like that. And, and that and that's after the after, after the February one of twenty one bond payment. So we've yeah. been really careful to work closely with Brady and his team to look at what you have currently, how much more you're likely to collect in twenty twenty, even with the the downturn in the economy, and then how much cash could you apply to the refunding and still have more than enough uh, for the payments that would still be due on two one of twenty one. And it's after that that we think you'll have 1.2 to 1.4 coming out on, on the other side. Does that answer your question, Commissioner Mills? Yes, thank you. And so, um, um, do we have a, and I, I know I have this information, it's just not my fingertips, but can you remind me um, by how much? Our collection is down this year. Our collection was down 15% in June. Year to date. Yeah, year, year to date, or that was through May. And then uh, in June, we rebounded. Um, I don't have that sitting in front of me. So we had a a rebound a little bit in June, and then uh, I expect July to be the same given what we've seen uh, from tourist activity downtown. So I don't know how to guess for the year, but uh, I don't expect that the fall will continue like that. But I expect that July, August, and given September, what I've seen so far, we're going to have a, a good rebound for at least three months and it's not going to be down uh, as much as we expected when this hit in in March. I think we've all been surprised by the tourism activity and it's showing up both in lodging tax and in sales tax. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Thank you. And um, Again, it's just uh, trying to be prudent with the uncertainty uh, yeah. going forward. I don't think there's going to be, well, who knows, but I wouldn't expect such an extreme lockdown as we first had. And I think that is exclusively why we had um, such a decrease in, in sales tax and lodging tax for that matter too, but um, for this conversation for sales tax. And so, you know, I'm a little nervous just because I, I think it, just with oh flu season, fall and school and everything yeah. um, that it, that our economy will be impacted, but it, it is um, the overall potential savings is great enough. Uh, that's quite a carrot to to go for, um, and and knowing that we have that 1.2 after our February 2021. Um, payment you know, <laughs> makes me feel pretty comfortable there, um, even with my nervousness. So, um, you know, I, 
I would I would greatly appreciate uh, um, the the details in our next board packet, but I am I am comfortable with with uh, you know the, the the way forward here, um, and and greatly appreciate the the work that's that's being done to to protect our taxpayers. Uh, it's a lot of money to save, <coughs> and uh, and the more we can do of that, the better. Uh, I think that's all for me. Over. Okay. I agree with you. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions from commissioners? Okay. Yeah, so I'm Mr. Chair, I'm just I'm looking at the sales tax report now. And with uh, July, we're we're at 14% uh, below um, last year. So last year we were at 873,000 at this point. This year at 747, um, so down just 120 some thousand. But I, last year was exceptional too. So here's another perspective. Last year, uh, these these bond payments that you see out here in the schedule are going from 1.1 to 1.2 million per year, but now they're going to drop down to starting out at 900 and some thousand, and then going over a million. Well, in 2019, we took in 1,793,673 in sales tax. So, and that's exceptional. The year before was 1,689,000 and so forth. So you might not expect those type of numbers going forward, but the difference between that and the payments in the next three years of 970,000, um, and so forth on this schedule. Um, 982, 970, 981, 996, and compare that to, you know, uh, pulling in 1.6, 1.7 million, even with a cutback for a year, even if you had a significant cutback for a couple of years, uh, there's, it's hard to see any impact on this. I really expect, um, will still be paying off even these refunded bonds early because of the sales tax coming in. Um, that's my expectation. Okay. Mr. Very Chair. Good. Go ahead, Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And and thank you, Brady, for that perspective too. Uh, like, like you say, even, am I understanding it right then, even if we did have significant uh, reduction in sales tax collections with these new lower um, payments w with our reserves we could with, with our sales tax money reserves we could potentially you know make up that difference for 10 years is that is that a po i mean is that a possible if we're even um even if we take a cutback to what we've been receiving of 20 percent of our sales tax overall, we're still going to be putting money in the bank to pay potentially pay off the refunded bonds early. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, over. Okay, anything uh, from any other commissioners? Then uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve by resolution to authorize the others and associates to assist the county with the issuance of $10,455,000 in taxable GO sales tax revenue refunding bonds to refinance the remaining 2011 and 2012 sales tax bonds for future interest savings. Do we have a motion to that effect? Motion to approve. Okay, do we have support? Support. Okay, roll call vote. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Mr. Storley? Aye. Mr. Bersheim, aye. Thank you, Bruce, for joining us. And thanks, Brady, for all your work on this. And it's a very good thing for our county going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And our tax taxpayer. OK, I will go to administrator updates. Uh, Rena Rogers, would you like to take over here? Uh, so. Um, I want to give a little bit of an update on CARES Act funding this morning. Um, 
So we, we proceed to try and push as much money out of the $730,000 that we received as possible. Um, just quick in, in way of update, the uh, business part of our task, task force, which uh, consists of uh, uh, the EDA director, Mary Somnus, um, our chamber director, Jim Boyd, and um, our small business administration, Pat Campanero, um, sent out, did a, a round one. And out of that, we distributed around $88,000 to businesses um, uh, that were 10 employees or fewer to reimburse them for costs associated with COVID. Things like plexiglass and PPE and picnic tables for outside dining, that sort of thing. They have uh, pushed out a second round um, and extended it to bigger businesses. Um, and that's due on Friday. And we're hoping, and they're advertising it and trying to do that. We are also allowing the businesses who've already applied to apply again. Um, if there's additional funding or if they've had additional experience expenses. So that's going on. Um, in addition to that, going out this week, there's gonna be um, with the assistance of Linda Jurek at Visit Cook County, um, a survey uh, to restaurant owners um, asking them uh, you know, what their challenges are um, this winter as people start moving back inside again to see if there are specific issues that could be addressed with CARES funding. So we're continuing to try to address the significant challenges that, um, that our small businesses have up here with CARES funding. So we move forward with that. Um, on the public health human services side, um, the granting process that our, our public health advisory committee does um, had a different arm this year in addition to the regular stuff. Uh, related to the CARES money. And through that process so far, uh, we've approved the distribution of $112,000. Most of that is actually for um, changes to daycare providers um, to help with families who, um, you know, well, to make sure that our children are safe when kid kids are going to daycare. Um, some of that also is uh, gone to a uh, proposal from the Y, um, who is working in conjunction with the school to provide some distance learning pods and after school daycare so that people can work and their kids can um, get the educational support they need. And in this case, we, we approve money that um, uh, would be specifically to, to assist families uh, who have more economic challenges. So using using the metric of kids on um, free or reduced lunches, we're um, able to help support the cost of that daycare for them. So, so those things are going on. In the meantime, we are continuing to look at things in the courthouse um, as we ramp up or you know, just continue our kind of our precautions around um, cares or about around COVID. Um, I know Brian was in the commissioner's room here the other day. Uh, we were talking about trying to figure out a way that if commissioners wanted to come back and have their meetings in here, um, that we could set up temporary plexiglass um, kind of stations between you that would help you um, be safe um, within this room. Uh, we're also looking at different changes on our HVAC system and how we might be able to improve our filtration and maybe some ionization, some of the positive ionization stuff. So a lot of different things going on and we're, we're trying to move ahead with that. Um, kind of related to COVID, we're kind of, we're in that operational mode where a lot of people still are working remotely. We um, are open for courts and open for elections still and other things by appointment um, as we have been now for several months. Um, and I know that Brady is working a lot and we've had several conversations on this next round of elections. Uh, last time at the courthouse, we had um, sort of a canopy outside. And so people didn't have to come in if they were just dropping off ballots. Uh, that worked pretty well in August. It might not work as well in November. So I know that Brady has been really advocating uh, for absentee ballots in our two precincts where people vote in person. And I think those percentages are actually 
really high right now of, of, of people even returning them already or requesting them. Um, so we're, we're trying to do what we can to keep everybody safe and we continue to do that um, uh, every day and, and keep kind of facing that challenge and try to use this money that we have from the government, government to spend it wisely around that. And then last, um, we've certainly started the transitional meetings um, and transitional process for our new county administrator, which um, I'm just, you know, I've had uh, one meeting with him myself and I just think y'all made such a great decision. I just think he's really uh, gonna be good for the county. Um, but I know April has been busy getting a lot of things set up so that when he gets here, you know, he'll have his computer, his phone, his cell phones, his name plates, his business cards, all of it are ready to go. And, and you probably, in some of the meetings that you're in, um, you may see that his name has already been added to those meetings, um, getting, getting, him, uh, getting him just on board so that there's not a lag there. Um, I think that's what I have today. Okay, any questions or comments? Um... For Administrator Rogers, I thank you so much uh, for what you're doing um, and all the work that you've done and sort of getting into a new phase. And thanks so much for uh, sailing this ship uh, through some rough waters <laughs> and uh, unknown territory. And so you've really done well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mills, I see you light up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rena, for the update. Uh, in the in the in the cares um, committee um, or advisory group um, did did you have a chance to discuss the northeastern Minnesota office of job training request is that uh, was there any light shed on that we did um, so I think we'll Brady and I need to look at that we need to um, we talked about yesterday um, getting some more accurate, numbers of what's been posted on CARES um, to, to, uh, <laughs> to before, we, before we commit something and get ourselves over committed. So we're just, um, I think in general, people thought um, there, were, there were good uses for that, that we use that, that um, service. Um, so I think we will probably do this, but I wanna get some more complete numbers on what we spent on the county side first just to make sure we have enough room. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for, thanks for considering it and talking about it. Um, if, if possible, I know you're extremely busy. It, it, it might go a long ways just to, uh, and maybe you already have given a, a follow-up, uh, an additional follow-up um, e note or email to uh, Marie about, about where things are at and, and uh, that, that decision will be made. Uh, not too long. Okay, um, I'll do that. But, I'll but, do. Yeah, thank you very much, though, for for all the work that you're doing. Um, much like uh, Commissioner Bersheim said, uh, yeah, some really difficult waters here to to go through, and um, really appreciate the work and the way in which you've done it. Uh, over. Okay. Um. We'll move on then to uh, our um, commissioner reports, I believe. Um, if uh, you have a report as commissioner, <laughs> Rand or uh, Commissioner Mills, I can see your light go on, I think, when you request to speak. So any reports from commissioners at this time? Okay. Go ahead. Yep, just uh, wanted to report that um, we've uh, we've met with CCEA with uh, union negotiations, and that we will. Um, this is Commissioner Storley and I, and uh, and staff, and we'll be um, meeting with uh, the 49ers uh, tomorrow, and um, and then uh, and then LELS forthcoming. So um, um, one of the one of the thoughts and uh, discussion points was just, uh, you know, a lot about the uncertainty that that we're facing as a community as well as a, the county organization, and um, 
so um, one of the thoughts um, was if we could um, have Commissioner Storley and I be on the negotiating committee next year, uh, and that was asked if that could be in the contract, and it sounded like that was a possibility as far as, you know, us putting it in there. It's just whether or not the board will approve it, but it's just something I wanted to put on the radar um, for for people to consider. Um, and uh, and but otherwise, I I'm I'm happy to be in in the process and um, learning a lot as I go there. So um, thank you for the board's support and and putting putting us on there. Over. Yeah, and thank you to uh, you, uh, Commissioner Mills and story for serving that capacity. I certainly think it's a good idea to make a commitment to that. I, as far as a legal issue, uh, I would hope that we would consult with Molly Hick and that should that be part or our contract, uh, our negotiations contract attorney to see if that should be in a written agreement. Uh, it's only a technical issue. I, I don't see a problem with it, but I, I, I haven't seen that in, my experience at least, and maybe it is possible, but I, I would think that they, that could be a memorandum of understanding, but I don't know if that should be part of the negotiated contract. Just a question, technical issue. Yeah, excellent point, I agree 100%. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to make sure that's, that's legit. Okay. Any other uh, reports? <clears throat> Commissioner Mr. Yeah. The only thing I have to report on is that last week was really busy with Zooming. <laughs> and um, I did attend um, two sessions of public health and human services, but I'll give that report when we when we meet with them. It was very, was very intense and it was um, good for a couple of platforms coming up and uh, I'll get the final result um, probably in another week or so on recommendations going forward, um, probably sometime in December. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Anything else? Then I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Do we have support? Support, Commissioner Mills. We'll do a roll call just because it is a Zoom meeting. Uh, Commissioner Dukirk. Aye. Commissioner Mills. Aye. Commissioner Storley. Aye. Commissioner Bersheim, aye unanimous. Thank you for a very productive meeting to our commissioners and to our staff that assist us and we had a very good meeting. And uh, thanks for the public that those that did observe us and always welcome to observe our meetings. And with that, have a good day to everyone. Bye. Thank you, Thank you. you too.